there's a lot more happening downstream uh, and, and potentially, I guess, midstream in the in the battery space in the U.S. And that's, uh, you know, that was really a focus of the Biden administration when they came in, uh, you know, kind of wanted to win electric vehicles. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, content session for the one to one global online tech metals event. Uh, today to talk about the U.S. clean energy transition and its impact on public policy and the mining and investment industries. I have Ian Lang, Director, Mi uh, Mineral and Energy Economics Program at the Colorado School of Mines, and also former Senior Economist at the Council for Economic Advisors at the White House. So, Ian, thank you very much for being us with us today. Oh, I'm excited to be here and talk mining policy. <laughs> Sounds great. So I guess uh, let's jump right in. Um, let's take a, a bit of a historical look. And I wanted to see, you know, what have you seen in your time advising the US government in terms of energy policy? And where do you see things moving as the global focus on the energy transition and on climate, th uh, climate change strengthens? Yeah, there is uh, uh, some overlap between the two parties when you get beyond, well, might say like the politics. So in policy discussions across Republican or Democratic administrations, they're oftentimes not that different. Um, they all want investment. They all want job growth, right? They all want sort of better outcomes for, for citizens. And so making arguments to that effect uh, are always going to ring uh, to the to the politicians, although, you know, in public or in discussions, uh, it, it doesn't, might not seem that way, but there's a lot of overlap, um, you know, and, and then similarly, there are, you know, there are upsides and downsides to every type of mining investment. It's been, it was uh, kind of, you know, public towards uh, the end of 2020, right, that the um, Republicans were kind of torn on the, the people mine in Alaska, um, some for it, some against it. And similarly, I would say now a lot of, you know, for the Democrats, there's some for then some against different sort of mine or mining projects. And so there's a lot of, some, there's a lot more similarity than you might expect from uh, the way people talk. And I think that's just a result of politics. Um, so historically, right? So there's uh, basically, there's obviously a preferred um, industry, you might say, right? So oil and gas is, is, is much more um, in the mind of uh, Republican politicians. And, you know, and I saw that certainly in discussing energy issues with, uh, uh, Republican officials, um, and uh, where you might say clean energy technologies are much more in the mind of Democratic officials. So, so I mean, so it's not you know complete overlap. There is there is part of the Venn diagram where they don't overlap. So historically, that's kind of been been an issue, and there there are uh, you know points where that's where there, in some sense like that matters. And you think about the um, corporate average fuel economy. Uh, numbers within the U.S. where the, the Trump administration tried to push the number back down and the Biden and Obama administration push it back up and, and hoping to, you know, either, you know, encourage their preferred, their preferred industry. Um, I will say, you know, everybody uh, from, from the, everything about upstream mining, everybody does kind of understand that uh, there are uh, concerns about permitting new, you know, new, um, assets and things that may have to be done. And, and in some sense, there's 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 a lot of overlap there, but again, there's some things that are missing or there's some places where the Republicans and the Democrats don't agree, right? So we might see things in like the NEPA reform where uh, the Trump administration put forward some changes to that. The Biden administration has has um, uh, rescinded those changes or, or changed those changes for lack of a better word. Um, and then, you know, this, there was a, a call in the Senate basically to, to restore to kind of reject the uh, what the Biden administration sort of had changed, um, it's not going to go anywhere because the House is not going to to follow the the Senate there. But anyways, you can see that there's you know there's lots of um, there, there's lots of discussion amongst both sides of the political aisle, right? That things have to be done to say change the permitting process or improve permitting process or you know alter how people think about these assets and how they get into the um, production process. But, you know, there's many parts of, say, the Biden administration that's very much, you know, we, we don't we wouldn't call it uh, America first, but we might call it, you know, something like good blue collar jobs, good manufacturing, bringing jobs, reshoring jobs. Um, you know, friend shoring was a some was something that both the Trump and the Biden administration, you know, are thinking about or talking about. You know, do we try to have Canada and Australia? 
produce uh, some of these minerals and then you know we sort of take them in mid slash downstream so again there there there's definitely many, many lots of places of overlap um and there's slight you know there's slight differences about maybe how we want to to, to reach the the goals um but yeah i would say that they're they're not they're not that large for lack of a better word um, so you started to bring up the um, kind of the permitting issues that are currently happening uh, in the U.S. So what's happening on that front? What does it mean for the future growth of the industry? Yeah, so uh, the big news in the last, uh, you know, say six months, right, is the so basically this deal that Manchin was able to put together with um, Schumer and Pelosi that, you know, if he sort of supports parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, there'll be a vote on permitting reform uh, sometime in the fall. And so I guess, you know, one can argue whether that was a good deal for, uh, we'll say like centrist Democrats or centrist Republicans who might've wanted, uh, who, who want some sort of permitting reform. Um, I think we can see already, there's a bit of a lobbying effort in order to ensure that this permitting reform keeps moving forward. Obviously it wasn't, in, it was not in the Inflation Reduction Act and, one could call it kind of like the poison pill where they put the EV tax credits uh, are kind of restricted to firms who are getting upstream battery materials uh, domestically or, or in uh, areas where we have free trade agreements. Um, and so I think, you know, the whole idea there is that that's going to kind of be a lobbying push or be this, you know, uh, this, this um, support that pushes uh, some sort of permitting reform over the line. Um, I have not heard, and maybe they, if they've announced when they plan to bring this up, but obviously currently the House and Senate are on vacation or on, on recess, whatever the word is. Um, and so, but you know, that's, that's, uh, that would, to the extent that something happens through Congress, that would be a big deal. Um, as I mentioned previously, right, so there have been attempts to sort of alter the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. Um, one issue is that, you know, that's sort of, congrats, it's, a, it's a law that went through Congress, right, obviously signed by the president. And like all things in the U.S., right, there is oftentimes the way Congress writes a law, it's there's scope for the executive branch to be able to change things around the margin a little bit, but um, it has to sort of follow the, 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 legal, um, uh, the legal rules around whatever Congress writes. And so, Anything that the executive branch does to say, say alter how the National Environmental Policy Act works or things like that, um, you know, are basically fairly tenuous if they get through because the next administration can go and change it or somebody can sue and have a, a, you know, a, a judge basically say this doesn't seem like it's in the intent of the original, the original congressional writing. And so, you know, having Congress rewrite something is a, is a, is a big deal, right? It would, it would really change the dynamics uh, and how things do get through the federal permitting process. Um, and so that's, I think, where everybody's attention is right now on the permitting side. We hope for some sort of uh, change to the rules uh, you know, that go through Congress. I mean, there's been a bunch of attempts in the past and they always kind of hit some roadblock even if you try to tie it to something that's popular, or even if you have, you know, the 10 centrist senators on board, you can't get either side, you can't get either of the other sides. And then nothing, you know, nothing substantial changes. Um, when we, if interested, we can discuss, you know, more details of, of what has changed. But anyways. I guess um, as a follow-up, you know, if, if things don't change with, with, with the permitting, what is the impact of that? Well, it's really hard to see how we alter, you know, maybe like the current dynamics, right? So um, there are very few new mines that get permitted or that open in the U.S. And the ones that um, sort of are in the process are in the process for a long time. And so it's hard to see, a, a, you know, a dramatic change in how um, how the, the, the system of producing uh, say, you know, the minerals that we expect to be used in the energy transition to be made in the U.S. Um, and so, you know, then you'd be more relying on some sort of French shoring and you'd expect more out of uh, Canada and, and Australia, uh, places like that, maybe using, uh, also using um, our, our apparatus within the federal government to promote, you know, projects in, um, in less developed countries. Uh, or something like that is a, is a another means to get more minerals into the market. But you know, it's just it's pretty hard to see. And you can look to many different examples of of mines that have some sort of federal nexus that you know just uh, sort of either the the firms sort of give up 
or it seems, you know, they're kind of in perpetual uh, environmental impact statement, trying to figure out how they move forward. Um, and, and then you wonder how long are investors going to support those companies if they're waiting five, 10 years to get some progress moving forward. You know, and, and in some sense, right, these, these issues are not, um, are not just NEPA, so we shouldn't over overstate maybe the, the impact of NEPA, right? There's obviously the um, the sort of slowdown of uh, the process for Piedmont in North Carolina that's on private lands, so it doesn't need a federal permit, but the county permits, you know, haven't come as maybe as quickly as some people would have hoped. And so again, all these, you know, states similarly, states have rules, um, and and those are not always. Um, either the you know the most straightforward or the ones that folk that uh, the mining companies uh, you know feel that you know they can move forward quickly on. I mean, there are states that uh, that that do move things quickly, like Nevada, but there are other states where there are deposits, and it's unclear how you know even if there's not a federal nexus, that how the, how quickly the state will move forward. Will the state kind of understand the impacts um, of some of these investments and and have sort of a clear path to moving? Uh, moving the mining forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, re I read a, an article, I think, this morning saying that um, I believe it was Sweden is having similar permitting issues um, for a lot of their mines. And it's kind of impacting the entire kind of EU battery supply chain. Um, you know, the, this idea of domestic or more regionalized supply chains has been a, a growing um theme that we've seen, especially like since the start of the pandemic. Um, what are some of the lasting impacts that you're seeing of, of this kind of new idea or this new theme within the industry? And, you know, what are the impacts that, you, that you're going to see? Well, it certainly seems to me that if you, you know, anyone who has a permitted asset, we'll say in an OECD country, is kind of in the driver's seat, right? So yes, as we sort of you maybe take a step back from globalization or as we try to, you know, I, whether we call it more French shoring or being more domestic in, in, in production and instead of sort of relying on um, potentially less friendly countries for all of the upstream and midstream uh, uh, processing, you know, of, of minerals, right? As, as we try to move to make it a little more domestic or friendly, you know, friendly nations. If you have a permanent asset in one of those countries, you know, you're kind of in the driver's seat uh, there's there's going to be there, I would expect there's a lot more potential interest in your products. Um, so when you're writing contracts, right, you kind of say, you know, your other option is to, you know, is to take uh, is to take it from China. And, you know, we know what their the geopolitical issues are there. We know what the ESG potential issues are there. You know, so what would you like uh, in some sense? And I think you will also see what that also means is that if folks with uh, permitted assets in OECD countries to the extent that they can um, sort of alter their production mix or expand, maybe, maybe like expand their production mix. I'm thinking specifically of Rio uh, Tinto uh, starting to take scandium out of um, out of some of their waste stream and, and, and sell that. I mean, these are going to be, you know, profitable or likely to be profitable projects that 10 years ago wouldn't have been because you, the overarching sentiment was, you know, well, it's either cheaper or there's, you know, we can expand production in, uh, we'll say, a place like China, whereas now, you know, that's that's sort of less exciting for many firms. The political situation looks a little more difficult. Um, and and then there's more incentives to think about domestic production. And so, you know, whether you get low interest loans or grants or something like that to expand, you know, domestic employment or domestic production, um, that's just going to lead those firms with, you know, already permitted assets even more in the driver's seat. And again, similarly, as we talked about the permitting before, you, you know, someone who might say, oh, I'd like to enter that space and, you know, maybe build a copper smelter, you know, or build a rare earth uh, processing facility, right? These are kind of harder. They, they, these are not easy things to do. They're going to take a long time. And so somebody who has an asset already going is not kind of in the driver's seat. Interesting. Um I thought we could touch a little bit about kind of the battery sector, the battery metals um, and the growth that you're seeing within the US. Um, also the idea of kind of involving the upstream um, within this sector, how is it all coming together, I suppose? Well, sort of not surprisingly, you know, there's a lot more happening downstream uh, and, and potentially, I guess, midstream in the, in the battery space in the US. And that's, uh, you know, that was really a focus of the Biden administration when they came in. 
uh, you know, kind of wanted to win electric vehicles. You also have these sort of legacy car producers, say in the, in Michigan, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, places like that, um, that were sort of politically important. And so, you know, that's where we've seen the most uh, sort of news or most, you know, uh, discussion, investment going in. Um, and there's been, in some sense, less less wins, for lack of a better word, on the, the midstream and the upstream side. Uh, you know, there, there are things that are happening, right? So there's the there's announcement about six or eight months ago that, you know, um, uh, Mountain Pass materials would restart their, uh, their, their processing facility for Earth. That was in discussion for a long time. There was lots of, there, you know, certainly under the Trump administration, there was lots of discussion uh, amongst their politicals that that was going to happen. We were going to make that happen, um, you know, and in some sense that it ends up happening now in, uh, you know, under the Biden administration. There are also issues like, you know, the, the Department of Defense, you know, signing loan guarantees or signing um, agreements with producers to help them build the processing facilities. Um, and I guess you would sort of think uh, assume or hope that with DOD participation behind them, then sort of siting and permitting become a little easier. <clears throat> you know, there is thoughts of how do we, how can we use the current federal land slash infrastructure to do some of these things uh, more easily? You know, some of that's less explicitly mining, but if we think about things like transmission, uh, transmission lines for electricity, right, there's lots of hope to try to use, you know, uh, sort of like the, the, you know, along highways, along rail lines, or places where there's some sort of federal authority already to over, in some sense, maybe override other, you know, either political concerns or, or you know, strategic competition amongst firms. Lots of times, uh, some fir another firm will block, you know, a second firm from from building a new asset because it might become competition for the original firm. And so there's a lot of talk about trying to use the federal government to get around that. Um, and so, you know, yeah, so these are, these are some of the issues, um, you know, that I guess that I, that I see. Um, okay, interesting. And um, going back a little bit, you, you know, we, we started to touch briefly about the, uh, the new infrastructure plan and, and uh, what's happening in terms of permitting. Can you maybe expand a little bit about, you know, the impact that you think it's going to have on uh, you know, future exploration or development, and I guess was the investment into the industry yeah. overall. Yeah. So the uh, a lot of these, you know, new uh, we'll say spending bills or however you want to call them of these new uh, laws. And, and for lack of a better word, it's easy for Congress to allocate money towards R and D, towards demonstration, towards um, you know something that's not actually we'll say like building the product. Um, and that's kind of always been the way, right? There's There's been lots of discussions over the last 10 years of like plans to get more minerals, you know, for the clean energy uh, transition. And they mostly revolve around like, tr you know, training workforce, R&D, just things that are easy for lack of a better word, right? And so <clears throat> I would say, you know, we, we could look back on, on the early 2020s as either like, you know, this time where we really spawned a whole bunch of new technologies, we spawned a whole bunch of new, you know, developments in whether it be processing or recycling or, you know, just getting things, uh, getting new uh, materials out of the ground through some sort of waste products. I mean, obviously, not surprisingly, it, you know, there's lots of talk of trying to get rare earths from coal ash wastes right there in, there's a lot of uh, coal ash <laughs> waste ponds. They're often in areas that are politically important like Michigan and Ohio, um, you know, and, and, and it's kind of a, the, the jobs are gonna be going away around those coal-fired power plants. We need something economically to do with that area. Like, hey, let's try to, you know, so I would say, you know, it's still an open question how much that R&D is actually gonna move things and, and maybe, you know, for, to just make things in, you know, incredibly safe, salient right after 2008, we had the, you know, we sort of had DOE put a bunch of money in demonstration projects or loan guarantees for new firms, right? And, and you, you know, out of that, we had Tesla and we had Solara, right? And so Tesla is obviously a very clear example of a win and Solara is a very clear example of something that didn't help uh, kind of move things forward. You know, competition amongst solar panel producers really sort of sank that investment. I mean, it looked like a good investment in 2007 and it looked like something that, you know, we should be trying to move forward with um, in 2007, but the markets changed a little bit. Obviously China getting into producing more uh, solar panels changed that, right? And so to some extent, again, to make, make, make a clear distinction, right? Like 
how what's the ratio of Tesla's to Solara's we're going to get out of you know the 2020 sort of spending bills that encourage a lot of demonstration projects that encourage R and D that encourage workforce training you know again whether those things are through loan guarantees or grants or you know I mean at, at a university like the one I'm at where obviously everyone is super excited about all these bills because they're like, look at all these grants we get to apply for, right? So what comes out of all of that? Uh, is it Tesla's or Solara's? Yeah. Okay, interesting. And I suppose that, that kind of brings me nicely to my final question, which is really kind of um, looking forward, um, you know, in terms of uh, US energy policy and um, direction and investment. Well, do you, what do you see happening in the short term um, and, and where do you see kind of things moving? Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, obviously the Inflation Reduction Act was, um, in my name and closure, was a whole bunch of carrots, right? There's no, there's very little sticks. There's very little um, fees or taxes or, you know, restrictions on um, some sort of, uh, we'll say, uh, oil and gas or fossil fuel sort of development, and it's all sort of carrots for renewable energy or clean energy technologies. And so, you know, it, it, that's that's helpful, obviously, uh, carrots are. I mean, my general sense is at some point, you also need some sticks. Um, at this point, most of the sticks are coming from the states. So, you know, we have a lot of states that are sort of mandating or requiring their energy system or their, their electricity system to move to, you know, carbon zero or move to, you know, all clean energy. And so one issue is, that, you know, one, one important part is like, how many more states are going to put in some sticks? How many states are going to try to take advantage of all of the carrots that are in the federal, uh, you know, in, in the federal bills? Um, and so, you know, how quickly do we kind of maybe like hit the inflection point on some sort of S curve where, you know, we we really start moving things along uh, um, in installation of, of these new energy technologies, whether that and whether that's CCS or hydrogen or just wind and solar and batteries on the grid or something like that, or EVs, right? Um, all of those things, all of those, you know, technologies have the potential to be kind of a, you know, a game changer in lots of ways or really alter how the either the electricity landscape works or, you know, how the transportation landscape looks. Um, you know, there are things, we have a lot of technologies uh, that, you know, in the fossil fuel era that rely on an economies of scale, meaning you just need, you kind of need something, a big machine that runs all the time. Um, and so, you know, sl small reductions in demand or small reductions in consumption of those um, fossil fuels, right, can have these large implications. So, you know, we have a refinery system in the U.S. All of them, you know, generally try to be running around 90 percent of the time. You don't want to turn them all down to 50 percent. That's just not how they're meant to operate. And so small reductions in sort of gasoline and diesel demand through things like electric vehicles, right, can have these sort of larger you know, knock on effects as we say, hey, we're just going to start closing some refineries because we're, again, we're not going to run them all at 50%. We're going to run them at, you know, 90 some, you know, we're, we're going to close a couple and then put the rest at, at 90%. Well, that will, that has this potential to cause all these sort of, you know, either regional price spikes or sort of maybe like temporal price spikes as we readjust to, to the new, you know, uh, system. And again, that starts to lead to like this, you know, whether you want to call it a, you know, a, a good circle up or a bad circle down, right? So oil prices up, more EV switching, you know, something happens to make oil prices go up again, more EV switching, right? And so we're just going to have, uh, or, you know, so we're going to have some sort of system that, you know, kind of, again, we hit that S curve or we hit this, you know, spiral where it just kind of self-reinforces due to this, you know, economies of scale production facility that we sort of have in the U.S. And so, it, you know, how soon will that, uh, you know, either that spiral happen or how soon will we hit that part of the S curve? I mean, it's, it's unclear, but we're certainly with these more recent laws, um, we're certainly closer to that. And then things like, you know, obviously this, uh, this upcoming election in the fall, to, the, to what extent might there be a number of new Republican governors or a number of new Democratic governors so that some states who are kind of on the fence right now about having a more you know, clear goal towards a, a carbon-free electricity system or a carbon-free energy system. You know, again, these, these, these things will matter and these things are gonna start tipping the scale, you know, at some point here. Okay. Well, certainly a lot to be kind of looking out for um, in the future, so. 
Um, that was all really interesting. Um, I really kind of appreciate your insight into kind of the, the political and uh, economic situation happening in the US. So thank you for joining us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you.